Hello and welcome to the Vasm Assembly podcast. Today's episode is going to take place at a very special location. I'm at Carnegie Mellon University in the WebAssembly Research Center. I'm going to be here and cover most of the things. Not everything, but most of the things. I'm really looking forward to spending the next days at the WebAssembly Research Center in Carnegie Mellon. I have with me Elizabeth, um, who is um, a PhD student here at the center. Elizabeth, do you want to talk about who we are, what you do? Yeah, sure. So I am a PhD student here at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I'm Ben Titzer's PhD student uh, at the WebAssembly Research Center, along with Heather Miller. She's also my advisor. Um, and right now I'm working on a bytecode instrumentation DSL for WebAssembly. So it's in order to support building instrumentation to create developer tools for WebAssembly specifically. Um, so if you're wanting to build debuggers, if you're wanting to build something that collects statistics about your application while it runs dynamically, you can do this writing by writing your instrumentation in the DSL. And the DSL works by injecting your instrumentation in whatever way makes sense for your application specifically. So it works in a lot of different domains. And the way that it does this is by abstracting over the method of injection. So it can either inject via something called bytecode rewriting. So it's taking the bytecode, literally injecting new instructions into the bytecode. So it executes your instrumentation dynamically when you're running your application, or it can interface with the underlying engine that your application is running on. And currently, the only engine that you can actually interface with to do this is the wizard research engine that's written by Ben, my advisor. Um, and we're hoping that over time, more engines will adopt this production uh, capable instrumentation support, basically. So you can write your instrumentation once in this DSL and then dynamically switch based off of your production target for your application to run in. Very exciting. So when we think debugging in WebAssembly, a lot of people might think dwarf, um, like you compile with some script and then you uh, inject uh, dwarf. What is the core difference there? So with this, um, it's only really injecting instructions. So in, in with Dwarf, I assume that this injects instructions in bytecode rewriting as well, or recompilation. Um, so an issue there is that it's intruding on the application state space. So it's running in the same state space as your application, which means that you could have issues with um, if if there are bugs in your instrumentation, then you could be introducing bugs in your application. Um, another thing is that you can only instrument specific things that are available to you with bytecode rewriting specifically. So considering things like garbage collection events or JIT optimizations running. Um, the only thing that would really know about that is uh, the engine itself. And so you would be limiting the scope of the events that are instrumentable as well. Cool, thank you. Um, Elizabeth had a paper um, that we will link in the show notes. So if you're interested in learning more, I um, very much encourage you to read the paper and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Yo, so I'm here with uh, Adam Brachy K and he works at Definity and they built something called the Internet Computer. Adam, can you tell our listeners what this is? Yeah, uh, so the Internet Computer or the Internet Computer Protocol is a blockchain platform uh, which Definity contributes to. And uh, it's essentially a blockchain for running arbitrary computations. Uh, you could use it almost like any other cloud pa platform. Um, you'd, uh, you know, if you have some application and you can compile it to WebAssembly, you can upload it to our blockchain and then it will run in a decentralized, secure manner uh, on nodes all over the world uh, with uh, different participants, different data sets. All right, so in, uh, I saw in the documentation people built these applications um, in different programming languages. One of them is specifically created for um, the platform called Motoko, I think. And um, TypeScript as well, Python, I think, what, what, what I meant is it Rust, Rust, of course, Rust. Um, so yeah, people build these applications, compile them to WebAssembly, and then run them on the platform. And then um, we have a system that evaluates the cost of running those applications. And I'm, I thought this was pretty interesting um, in the talk that you gave. Um, can you just detail a little bit how you do these weights? How you, uh, how do you come up with the cost of calculation? Yeah. So um, the thing that's unique here is that since 
we're a blockchain and running in this decentralized manner, you have a bunch of different nodes which will all run your computation. And at the end, they need to agree on what happened, what that final result is. That's not too hard. But they also need to agree on how much to charge you, essentially, for the computation you ran. And in a standard cloud platform, you would just like time it or something and say what the time was. But since we have so many different nodes doing it and they need to agree, we need some deterministic way to decide uh, what the cost of running a computation should be. And so what we do in this case is we take your WebAssembly code and we have uh, our own weighting, which is essentially how much to charge for a given WebAssembly instruction. And we instrument your WebAssembly. So we, like at the beginning of a block, we'll beforehand statically check what happens in that block, add up all those weights and add a small instruction to decrement a counter based on what happened in that block. And depending on what those WebAssembly instructions are, some are cheaper, some are more expensive. Um, and to decide what those weights are, we have uh, our own benchmarking setup, which will build up uh, WebAssembly modules with sort of large loops. Uh, they're kind of like micro benchmarks executing the same instruction over and over again. And we uh, tried to see how much time or CPU cycles it actually takes on our given hardware, the hardware that's run on ICP to execute any given uh, WebAssembly instruction when compiled by WASM time. Um, and we use those to get a, an idea of how much to charge for each WASM instruction. So I guess if I knew more about the internet computer and the internet computer protocol, this uh, would be an easy, easy answer to uh, just get myself. But um, since I don't, I just ask you. So um, it sounds like you are doing some of the calculations redundantly on various nodes. So if you have a program, you would deploy to um, the IPC, um, it runs uh, ICP, it runs on uh, several of the nodes, and then you come up with the result. Um, but like, how, how do you deal with this, this redundancy? Um, yeah, so uh, the, yeah, there is redundancy. Like the computation will run on multiple nodes. Um, and uh, that's something, I guess, you know, there's a trade-off there, right? It, it is, uh, I guess, going to take more resources than running on some standard cloud system, uh, but there's some additional security you get there. And uh, within our system, there are actually different setups. It's, it's essentially actually like uh, multiple blockchains kind of like working together and communicating with each other. And uh, depending on which of those things, which of those sub chains your application is deployed on, there may be more or less nodes involved in the computation. And so when you have smaller nodes, you kind of have like less resource usage and, uh, uh, but you, as a trade-off, there's a bit less security in it and other, uh, and, and, and other sub networks have more you know, nodes and more security. So you might want to use like one of those. If you have an application that's like responsible for a lot of money or something, you might want to use one with fewer nodes when, uh, you know, it's just like your website for fun or something. Um, but in all cases, there's a range. So I think the smallest ones are maybe like 13 nodes or something. Um, and the larger ones are quite a bit more. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yes. In, in the smallest case, your, your stuff will be running 13 times. Uh, yeah, but there will be, uh, 13 nodes from different providers, different companies providing them different data centers across the world to get like a bunch of, uh, security there. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. We're back. Um, I just was waiting for lunch and, um, Dan Goldman from Fastly talked to me and said, Hey, I listened to the podcast, which is really nice. And, um, yeah, we started talking about, um, write once, run anywhere and um with fastly being in this market obviously um yeah we just got talking and all of a sudden i was like wait um this is a wasted conversation if you have in a lunch queue let's just hop onto the po podcast and this is what we did so yeah dan over to you like run once um right sorry write once run anywhere what does this mean for a company like fastly so for Fastly, it's really about having an ecosystem that a lot of developers can participate in. You know, whether they're targeting browsers or servers or better devices, having that same ecosystem across all three gives developers the flexibility to run, you know, use the same tooling, and then run the code in many different places. Um, and so Fastly, our idea is like, well, we're, the, we're one of the places you can run your code. And that's really what our angle is. So our, our interest in WASM is like, we want the ecosystem together to be as big and as strong and have as much in common as we can. Because that gives developers when they want to run in a, in a place like the Edge, where they can look at a company like Fastly and not have to worry about like, oh, I have to retool, I have to like retarget my application, rewrite my code. You know, your stuff already runs because you're already using Wasm, and you can just bring it over here and it works really well. So that's really one of our big interests in how 
like hoboism really helps us do what we do. And this may be a pretty um, provocative question, if you will. So um, with right ones run anywhere, if we just, as, we, as we just said, um, the vendor lock-in is pretty small, right? So um, as a company like Fastly, what do you do to keep um, your customers at Fastly and not move any, anywhere else? Yeah, for us, the, the differentiation really is the platform. We have a fleet of servers in lots of different places in the world, and we could offer a certain kind of performance. Uh, I mean, the edge networks, like what is an edge? You should, it's kind of like this place that's like halfway between the clients and the server. So it has a bit of insight into both sides. So for Fastly, like what we really have is that that presence. Like we are in the places, and we can have your code run in lots of different places. Uh, and so the, the, those that actually never interested in, in from Fastly's side of having any kind of lock-in, like you know your application code, you have to rewrite it or you have to you know use different, different tools, whatever. We actually want you to have the existing code be able to run in many different places because we think our network is good enough that it sells itself and uh, not have to worry about lock-in with, uh, with the application side. Cool. Um, so before we spoke a little bit about um, the differences between the platform. So we have the server um, where we have certain server APIs like Vazi, for example, and then we have the web. Um, and we got talking a bit into what this means for write once run anywhere. Um, what, what do you say about that? Yeah, so we just saw in a, in a recent session, um, we saw a talk about a framework called R3, which is for record and replay. Um, and one of the things that they did is they wanted to be able to run benchmarks, the same benchmark across many different WASM engines, including browsers, uh, but also including on non-browser engines like WASM time. Um, and in order to do that, um, like they ran an application that would run into browser and had a lot of imports that were, that were implemented by JavaScript. So they can let it call the JavaScript to do various things. Of course, they run that in a, in a non-web or non-browser engine. It doesn't have the JavaScript, so that doesn't work. So like there we did, we wrote once and we didn't run anywhere, but run everywhere because now we have places that it doesn't run. So I think Blossom is kind of in a, a middle state where like a lot of the, a lot of the problems of write once or anywhere have been solved. Like we have a bytecode, it's portable. Um, and, and a lot of work has been done to make sure that that bytecode is very much independent of where it's running and, and where it, what the context it's running in. Um, but we still do have more work to do to have, like if you wanted to write an actual benchmark that could run in any WASM engine, um, it still needs to have some kind of way of talking to the outside world in some way um, in order for code to run. And so that's kind of a space where, you know, we've done some work in the WASI space. I think there's a lot more work to be done in that general space of, you know, what is this context outside of a WASM program? And if we want to really like fully realize this vision of write once, spun anywhere, that that's kind of like the rest of the story that we need to fill in. Cool. Thank you. I'm here with Ben Titzer, who is sort of the head of this entire research center here. But um, why don't we just ask Ben himself to introduce him, the job, the uh, institute, the center, Ben. So my name is Ben. Uh, I've been around the programming languages community for a while. So I've been uh, involved in research for almost 20 years since I was a grad student. And uh, I worked in industry for almost 15 years. So I worked at Google for almost 10 years. Uh, on the V8 team. So I worked on the JavaScript engine inside of Chrome. And I mostly worked on compilers. That's mostly my background. And I also got interested in doing something else. So I kind of got dragged into working on Asm.js, making that faster. That grew into WebAssembly. So with some people from Mozilla, including Luke Wagner and Dan Goman and Alon Sakai, we started working on WebAssembly in about late 2014, which later became public in 2015. People from Google got pulled into it, and then eventually it became a collaboration with all the major browser vendors, and that is probably what I spent most of my time on in the past 10 years. So we ship products uh, with WebAssembly, and it became kind of an industry standard. I decided to leave Google at the end of 2019 for personal reasons. Also, I was interested in uh, doing research again, so I eventually ended up here at CMU. That's partly because of well, I wanted to be in the Midwest, so I wanted to be back in the U.S. CMU is a great school, and also Heather Miller is here. So I knew her previously. We were not good friends, but we were acquaintances. She basically invited me to come here, and that's how I ended up here. So I'm now currently a principal researcher in the S3D uh, department, which is the uh, Software and Societal Systems Department. That means we do all kinds of things. So we do software systems. It means we do a bit of societal computing and also software engineering. So I think I fit in there because I have a background in industry. So I've worked on actual products and things like that. Heather's also in the department. Heather used to be the director of the Scala Center. And so she kind of gave me the idea of setting up a WebAssembly Research Center. 
in particular, she was the director. She effectively set up the whole thing. And that was the, and still is the governing body for the Scala programming language. And what we realized is that, well, there is obviously a standards body for WebAssembly that's driven by industry. There's really not a, there's not a gathering of academics. There's some relationships there, but what we were trying to get to is kind of a common watering hole for people who are doing research in WebAssembly and also for industry people uh, to collaborate. So, and that's exactly what Research Day is all about. So actual CG members here. So a lot of my former colleagues at Google, Luke and all the people that I mentioned are, are going to be here. Uh, and we talk about WebAssembly topics. We talk about research topics around WebAssembly. Not only that research to being done here, but also from many different places. And the center is also a way to provide funding. So students actually need money to eat uh, and to do their research. That that requires some level of funding. So the center has funding from our partners at Shopify and Definity and Siemens and Woven, and also from the National Science Foundation. And that allows students to, well, do what students do, which is be graduate students. They get paid. It's not a lot, um, but then they can work on uh, topics in and around WebAssembly. And so the, the center has allowed us to get people to come and do things that they would not otherwise be able to do without the support. And they supported this event today. We also got some funding from Mozilla for this event today. So I think it's worked out great. We had about 60 people in attendance and about another people virtually talked about a lot of different things. There was a few talks from CMU and I'm just really excited that people are interested in. Cool. Um, so we met one of your students earlier today, um, Elizabeth. Um, like for the next semester, are you hiring PhDs? Um, where are you with your team? How big is it? Um, are you growing? Like where are you? So I've got two PhD stu students coming in in the fall and they'll be working with me on WASM topics. In particular, I'm very interested in wet, uh, excuse me, dynamic languages on top of WASM. So Python and JavaScript. There was a talk by Chris Fallon today about some approaches to making JavaScript faster on WebAssembly. I want to do a similar kind of thing, but looking at Python in particular. Um, Chris is from CMU. He got his PhD here. And so there's some relationships. So we talked in the in the background. And so we're not formally collaborating, but hope to. And I, that's one direction. I, I see that as such a big topic that there's multiple PhD topics inside there. Uh, we've got a number of interns that are working in the uh, the summer and also REU students, which is a program with the NSF to get undergrads to do research. So we got a lot of things going on. I have collaborations with other departments. So I'm in S3D, which is in the School of Computer Science. There's also the CSD, which is the Computer Science Department in the School of Computer Science. It's slightly confusing. CMU is a big place. Uh, but I've had collaborations going and co-advising students there. And Heather and I are co-advising, uh, excuse me, Elizabeth, whom you are in. in mm -hmm. Um, so for the industry partners, we have Shopify, you mentioned Siemens, um, the Definity Foundation, um, Toyota, Weave, Wave, what is it? Woven, <laughs> Woven, Toyota, Woven. Um, so are you looking for more industry partners? Um, are you good by now? Like how, how is that, um, how were they chosen? How did they apply? Um, can I tell a bit more about the industry partners? Sure. I mean, we're always looking for partners. I think that it makes sense to have people that are interested in WASM, that they have some, uh, maybe they're not shipping products yet, or maybe they're looking into it. Maybe they have research topics. So when we first started talking to Siemens, just to, to give them as a use case, uh, just a, an example of how someone becomes a partner. I had been talking to Chris Woods because he had been involved in the WASM CG and Siemens is actually in a lot of different markets that Bosch is in. Bosch is not currently a partner, but they do a lot of WASM research and they do a lot of collaboration with Anthony Rowe here, as I do. And it just seems that WASM was going to be big and still looks to be big in embedded systems, automotive systems. And it made sense for them to be involved. It takes some time for an industrial partner to line up with their internal processes and budgeting, how they actually find the, the funding. It's not a high bar. We don't really, we're not running like a million dollar research center over here. Uh, but uh, it 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 really is just about personal connections, uh, connection with how uh, the topics line up. Um, we don't really do sponsor research in the sense that where they propose a project and then we work on exactly that project. We work on something that's very closely related. We might have a student that works with that partner. Um, 
And that's partly because of specific rules about how funding works. But it's it's more of a it's more of an industry consortium. And we, you know, we also do some activities that are not necessarily research. So part of the the research center is also developing course materials. So a little bit of my VM's course, uh, 17760 that I've given it before, becomes publicly available for other people to do um, course projects around WASM. And so the funding also from the NSF has supported that. Mm -hmm. So if you go to CMU as a student, can you choose compilers, WASM as one of your subjects? Or like how, how involved in teaching are you here? So I teach about one semester a year. So um, last year I co-taught with Jonathan Aldrich a course that he designed. There is a small WASM component, but it's effectively a PL and compilers course. I really like that course. I learned a lot, so stuff that I did not know it was great to co-teach with him. Uh, students can take that course. That's an undergraduate course. We also had a master's student taking that. The course I teach is uh, about half undergrads, half grad students. Um, compilers course also uh, for undergrads, like a 400 level course here has options to use uh, WASM as one of the targets, is starting to creep in the curriculum. There isn't like a WASM course in the sense that like you take a WebAssembly course. I think it more fits into as a foundational technology. It's something that's mentioned. If you're talking about how interpreters work, maybe WASM is a, a good example of how to look at how a bytecode is designed. There are things about WASM that are also interesting from a, a PL theory perspective. For example, how does a specification look? How does verification and type systems and semantics work. And so those are things that are all part of the formal specification that you can look at too in the course. And people are using it for other projects. So uh, for example, in uh, networking, which was taught by Justine Sherry last semester, there was a, a pair of students that were interested in PL stuff and they wanted to do a project and they did a project with WebAssembly and P4, which is a packet processing language. So it's, I think there's ways to, to fit WASM into their curriculum that aren't necessarily like the core, you're implementing an engine or you're a compiler. Hmm. <clears throat> so I want to get back to um, research and um, industry uh, uh, for a moment. So there's a couple of industry conferences like WASMCon, WASMIO. Um, what academic uh, conferences are there for WebAssembly um, that people could target? And for you students particularly, um, if um, let's say Elizabeth comes up with uh, new advances in whatever um, she does, and um, she wants to propose that somewhere, where would, um, where would she go? Would she go to an industry conference, academic conference, just both? How do, how do people balance that, um, like, yeah, that there's two options, essentially? Right, so we see WASM publications show, showing up in almost every conference that I'm aware of. So PLDI, Uppsala, Popple. At Popple this year in January, there was a workshop organized by Andreas and Conrad, who were both uh, WASM members. That was the WebAssembly workshop. It wasn't, uh, it didn't have proceedings, so it wasn't actual publications. It was all just talks. Uh, but that kind of thing is cropping up. Uh, we publish papers in ASPLOS. We are sending papers to Usenix. WASM is popping up in systems conferences and database conferences, all, really all over the place. Embedded systems too. If you go through like you know, academics do this from time to time. If you go through like the web of citations, if you look at the PLDI 2017 paper, it's like something like 700 citations. It is all over the place. So there's lots of options. I think if you are an academic and you want to publish, you know, a research article, which is a step towards your PhD, you can get into a top conference. PLDI is a top conference for that. And so there's some really great research that happens there. If you want to give a talk about a tool that you built or a system that you made, industry conference like WASMCon, I gave a talk at WasmCon last year. I gave a talk at Strangely last year. Those options are available. So I think it's actually really, it's really a good level of buzz. Mm -hmm. And my final question is for the research day, um, do you have any plans on making this into like a mini conference or a, or a series where people could actually publish and then yeah, have something that counts as an academic publication? Or do you want to keep this low key as a gathering of people to just hang out, talk about WebAssembly? I think Research Day makes sense as a low-key thing that doesn't have a publication record. Um, there are rules around how publications work. I think it makes sense, for example, to evolve the WebAssembly workshop into a venue where you actually publish uh, papers. And so that, that typically means uh, that you work with the publisher to have proceedings. You work with, like, for example, SIGPLAN to get um, 
sponsorship because SIGPLAN will pay for the proceedings to be published because all that costs money. And of course, you need a venue. I think it makes sense if you're going to publish research papers, you should probably co-locate with the research conference. So PLDI is a good one, obviously. Uh, Popple, as we did before, but also maybe Splash. Um, and so having those things where I think like attracts like, and then WebAssembly Research Day is kind of like the confluence of these two things. All right. Thank you very much, Ben. I'm with Adam Klein here from Google. And um, we were just sitting on a sofa, staring at a poster, and just reflecting on the day. And um, something that we both noticed was um, this research day felt a little bit more hands down than previous re research days. So I asked Adam, hey, Adam, what do you think? Um, is VASM or will VASM be done in like five years or so? And um, yeah, this is what Adam said. So yeah, this research day, uh, compared to last last several, there were there were more uh, presentations about using WASM. In fact, all of them were about using WASM in some way or tooling around WASM. And there weren't very many discussions about adding things to WASM, um, which I think is how we got to that part of the conversation. And I think that's a really healthy uh, way for the research group to go. Uh, right now, we've been adding a bunch to WASM over the last couple of years. And it's can be really tricky to, to combine research and adding new stuff to the standard. The incentives and goals around figuring those things out are, are rather different. Um, you know, researchers are trying to uh, make progress in the field and publish stuff. Standard is trying to get things in the hands of users. And, um, and so some of the presentations we saw today were things building on the, all the stuff we've added to WASM and I see those as being able to turn in, or more likely to turn into things that can be used because they don't have to go through standardization. They can continue to be discussed in the research community and then be adopted by, you know, tool chain authors or people making developer tools or, you know, companies doing um, WASM runtime environments. As to your question about, you know, will WAS, does that mean WASM is going to be done? Um, no, I mean, we're going to keep adding things to WASM, uh, CPUs, keep evolving over time, WASM will continue to evolve. But uh, the rate of change, I would expect to slow. You know, we had a bunch of stuff that needed to be in the MVP, and then GC added a whole bunch more. But uh, hopefully we were going to be more in the tweaking stage uh, in the years to come rather than in the needing to add whole new swaths of, of things. And I think that seeing a little bit less of those whole new swaths come from the research community makes me feel more positive about uh, having good uh, relationships between the researchers and the WASM community and not having in the WASM standardization community uh, in, in both directions, that the researchers won't feel like they're being blocked when they come to the research meeting and, and hear that, uh, oh no, this, this idea is crazy. We, we don't want to work on that right now. So... All right, sounds good. So VASM won't be done. VASM will be continuing to evolve. And I guess that's pretty good news for everyone, industry and researchers. Thank you, thank you, Adam. I'm back and I have with me Yuri uh, Yotelli, um, who just had his branch hinting proposal be advanced to phase four. Congrats on that, um, Yuri. Thank you. Um, so we just had uh, Thomas Leifi on the show who summarized um, the proposal. So I want to ask Yuri more about the motivation. Like where did it come from? Um, how long did it take? Um, how did it go through the different phases? Um, yeah, so Yuri, can you tell us a little bit more about yeah, the coming from, um, yeah, how, how, did, how did this uh, come to life? Yes, uh, so uh, this uh, all came from like a very uh, concrete use case that uh, at my company, Linux Technologies, uh, we had. And uh, we have this product called uh, Chirpex, which is a x86 virtual machine that runs in the browser. Uh, and it uh, it's fast because uh, we do just-in-time compilation of um, the machine code uh, into WASM modules. Uh, and what we noticed is that, uh, like, you know, we, we try very hard uh, to make it, uh, the final machine code that, uh, let's say, V8 uh, finally produces to be as similar as possible to the original x86. So, so this is an interesting case where we start from x86 and eventually we end up in x86 again. And so we can very, you know, uh, directly measure uh, how big, how much bigger the final code is to the initial. Right? And so we did a lot of this, you know, measuring and trying to emit the most optimal code that the V8 likes. 
And we noticed that uh, there were a lot of cases where, you know, there are unlikely situations that you need to uh, check for. For example, I don't know, this is an executable page, somebody wrote on it, and then I need to throw away my WASM module from this code and, and, and run it again, right? Or many other situations where you are, I don't know, uh, I'm assuming that the flags, uh, some CPU flags are not used because then if you need to also take those into account, it will make it uh, uh, much uh, worse to to, to do op uh, arithmetic operations, let's say, right? Uh, so there are all these situations that you are guarding, okay, this is not happening, this is not happening, this is not happening. And you really want the the code that handles these more complex, uh, unlikely situations to be like physically uh, at the end of the function or anyway far from the rest of the code that you're running. Uh, because like in modern CPUs, you have the CPU, uh, the extension cache, for example, but you also, uh, the engine will do register allocation. So uh, some values will be spilled on the stack and other not, others not. And we want the engine to, you know, make a, a smart decision about, okay, this code doesn't really matter. So uh, it's fine if this code loads from memory uh, instead of having stuff in registers. Uh, and uh, we could measure quite nicely the, uh, the potential advantage of this because uh, there is an instruction, uh, it's called a, a BR on null, uh, which is uh, made for the GC proposal, where like yeah, something is null, uh, branch somewhere, right? And this was, uh, at this in VA, this was at the built-in branch hint, let's say, uh, that was considering this case to be unlikely. And by using this instruction, like in a clever way, so where, wherever we had our checks, we would craft this uh, null out of thin air if we, if we were not using GC in any way. And we figured out that this would uh, have the final code, uh, machine code result in the way we wanted, right? And it was faster. So the idea is, okay, let's make this properly, make it a proposal to expose this functionality to users uh, so that we can, you know, uh, it, it would be even faster because we don't have to create this null out of nowhere. And it would also be cleaner and, you know, we have a guarantee that this will work tomorrow because, you know, maybe tomorrow the Chrome team decides that this instruction shouldn't have this hint and then the thing is lower all of a sudden. That that was the initial idea. Um, when did you come up with this? Like, what, what year are we talking about? Yeah, so this was in the, um, 2020. So uh, I actually put it on the slide. So I, I, in September 2020, I first proposed this on the CG. Uh, before that, I think during the summer, we we were talking about it internally and uh, it would be nice uh, if this was a thing but you know we're initially a bit scared uh, like okay sh should uh, we're a small company right like uh, are we able to actually uh, propose a concrete thing uh, and and bring it uh, you know to conclusion ourselves uh, so yeah at the beginning uh, when i proposed this people were mildly interested but you know not really com nobody was committed to helping us in doing this so uh, from the beginning, we realized uh, if we do this, uh, it's on us to, to, to bring it forward, to talk with people and resolve all the issues. Uh, yeah, that's what we did in the last uh, four years uh, <laughs> until today. Amazing. So what is the final step now? So phase four is the last step, I think. So now it's becoming a standard. Um, who implemented this? I think... Um, how many engines do you need? Is it two, three? So you need two engines, uh, but actually all three major engines now has this uh, implemented in one way or the other. Uh, also, the, uh, there is actually a phase five, uh, but like it's more like uh, it's in the hands of the working group, not of the community group. And all they do is, you know, uh, every now and then there is, I think there is a poll in, in the working group. Should this officially ship and be in the standard? If not, maybe because, you know, might be that uh, the requirement is two engines. Let's say one engine still hasn't implemented something, so they will wait a little bit before uh, making it actually a standard. Or they might find, I don't know, some at the very last moment, some major issue, and then you need to send it back to the community group. But more or less when you reach phase four, at least my job is done, and they just need, uh, you know, the uh, vendors need to vote on it finally. But uh, yeah, more or less is done. So is there any kind of, let's say, veto right that the working group has over the community group decision? So could they say, um, oh, you may have decided this in a community group, but actually at the working group level, we veto it. Could this happen? I think so in principle, but like, I think that all of the members of the working group are also community group members. So hopefully, you know, they would raise those issues if they knew about them beforehand. And if this actually comes at the very end and nobody realized it, then I think it's fair to go back and, and potentially fix it, right? Yeah. All right, makes sense. So fingers crossed that this will make phase five and uh, congratulations on getting it, getting it to phase four again.
All right, we're back. I have with me Emmanuel Ziegler, who is also from Google, and he's championing the Compilation Hints proposal. Um, Emmanuel, what is compil Compilation Hints good for? Why do we need it? Yeah, so uh, we currently rely a lot on runtime feedback. So especially with Wasm GC, where we have uh, quite a dynamic environment, it's it's much less like hardware compilation. It's more like a virtual machine. Um, we they need a lot of information that we collect at runtime, and in order to do inlining, we do speculative inlining and things like that. And it takes quite a while to actually reach that hot state. And very often we can predict from other use cases. Uh, what actually that hot state is going to be. So if we had that information ahead of time, we would know immediately what to do and we could immediately go to the uh, higher tier. So um, it basically just saves us time during startup. There are also some interesting side effects of that because um, there is also ahead of time compilers, for example, for WebAssembly, which V8 is not really involved in, but other compilers exist that will do something like that. And um, those would also benefit from that because they don't even have the possibility to collect runtime information. Uh, another use case is um, there might be information that is too expensive to collect at runtime while the user executes it, but you can do that in a profiling run. And uh, that information uh, could also then be added um, to the module and we would know about that and could adjust our compilation accordingly. I see. Um, so this seems related to branch hinting. Um, what, are, what is the difference? What are the uh, communities? Um, the similarities are actually really big. And I think branch hinting was just ahead of time and um, was the first compilation hint uh, kind of that was added and therefore also created a lot of the, the playing field that we can now play on. Um, I think the, the focus there was very specific. Compilation hints is a much broader focus. Um, as I said, it's it's a lot about um, really saving time, uh, getting the information earlier. So we know by now what kind of information we need and what would help us. And we are using this now to form a new proposal uh, that encompasses all that information. So at the um, community meeting, you presented um, the proposal. Um, what phase is it in? Is it phase two? Phase one. Okay. So the next step for you would be what exactly then? Um, there are a lot of very technical questions that need to be answered, um, which are maybe not super interesting, but need to be resolved before we uh, reach the implementation phase. And phase two kind of marks the, okay, we understand enough about the proposal that we can start implementing. And so what we currently do is we implement our own uh, prototype in order to kind of inform the, the um, proposal. Um, but we want to reach then enough consensus uh, to reach phase two that also other engines can start implementing that. And so reaching that consensus will happen offline on the repository of the proposal. And once we have that consensus, then we'll go to phase two and hopefully uh, more engines, more compiler tool chains uh, will follow. Are you in talks with any engines already? Like, hey, um, whatever, JSC, would you be interested in doing this? or? Do you just hope and wait for the best to happen? How, do, how does that work? Yeah, these things usually are very um, uncoordinated. Like they, it, it tends to be that there is usually uh, one or two engines that have a high interest in those use cases because they face similar problems and they will just start going. But there is no coordinated effort and say, okay, we need to get two engines who is volunteering or something like that. Um, it kind of happens more organically. Um, sometimes it also can happen that a proposal gets stuck because no other engine is interested in it. And, you know, that's also some kind of feedback, I guess. Did this ever happen and then um, someone just paid Egalia, for example, to implement? Um, that could happen. So that means then at least someone out there is interested in that engine implementing it. So that's a good sign. Um, but most of the time, um, so we have this requirement that uh, two engines, so web engines need to implement it. and um, for all the proposals that are sufficiently interesting, uh, that usually happens automatically. All right. So here's hoping that we will see um, this proposal move on to phase three pretty soon. Thank you very much for being here. And um, yeah, back to phase two. <laughs> all right. Thank you. We're back. I have with me Ilya Rezwov from uh, Google. And um, he just had a presentation on FP16. And um, yeah, we 
had an interesting voting situation where the majority of people voted for um, the proposal in a neutral way, which means anything or nothing, or they don't care, they just don't care. Um, so first, I want to just know from Ilya, what is this, this proposal? Why is it so important? Why does Google champion it? Why do we care? Uh, so yeah, uh, today, like everyone talks about AI, so, uh, and uh, Wasm is not an exception here. So uh, uh, to unlock uh, that CPU power, uh, they have uh, for AI um, applications. And usually you don't really need big pre precision uh, in computational here, you more care about like volume of computation. NFP sixteen here is uh, like best way to uh, operate, uh, and uh, for example, excellent park, um, a way to run neural networks uh, on uh, web uh, as well. Um, they uh, showed uh, like 40, 50 percent uh, performance improvement uh, for. Um, on mobile devices, when we use FP16 against uh, F32 uh, for inference uh, and uh, for uh, writing models. So it's a pretty um, obvious long hanging fruit for Wasm uh, to grab. Uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, it, it was uh, like uh, we have uh, that CPU power available, but we can use it. So it was a primary goal to unblock it. So the performance improvement sounds like a no-brainer. Um, I guess this was an Android, but nonetheless, we had some opposition from um, folks from Apple, from folks from Intel. Um, Android CPUs are mostly, I guess, Snapdragon. Um, so was there any um, like reason why, for example, someone from Apple, um, the iPhone company, would be against all these improvements? Um, does it not run as well maybe on ARM processors, or what, what is the problem? Uh, it's actually quite opposite. Uh, it's the ARM and Apple processors uh, actually uh, pretty good in running uh, FP16 values. Um, I think it's more deep, like philosophical question about uh, how we mm, treat uh, WebAssembly instruction set because um, there is strong uh, stress on portability and the predictable performance, and uh, FP16 being pretty widely brought, uh, computational extensions still not uh, universal. So, for example, um, X64 uh, uh, supported uh, only for really big uh, server-side uh, CPU line uh, and only plan to add the support for consumer-grade uh, devices. So, yeah, um, it opens the gate to like philosophical discussion. Should we add something what available only on one type of CPU for portable set? And because it's going to be uh, emulated on other platforms, like we open um, another gate for unpredictable performance. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a long lasting discussion uh, on uh, like how uh, we should approach um, how, how we should approach uh, topics uh, when we have obvious uh, performance gains, but uh, it, uh, uh, it goes again uh, against uh, uh, principles uh, of uh, predictable performance of what? I see. So on the web, we have a couple of APIs that are Chrome only, so other vendors oppose um, these APIs. I guess in WebAssembly, um, the situation is a little different. So if the other vendors should oppose, like let's say Apple continues to um, be not happy with this, they say maybe even strongly oppose, um, would this proposal have a chance to then survive in V8, where I understand it's already implemented, um, I guess somehow behind a flag or something? Um, so would this be then a Chrome-only feature? Or would we say, OK, if they're not happy with it, um, we will scrap it even if we initially wanted it? Yeah. Um... The, uh, as you mentioned, with Wasm, it's not that easy to live like in a world of uh, partially completed features uh, as we get used to do uh, in uh, in JavaScript world. So yeah, probably um, it won't be uh, viable to continue to work on it if we uh, will hear like a strong no from other uh, browser vendors because uh, for potential users, uh, it, it's, it means uh, they 
uh, we'll need to switch uh, like yeah we, we need to build differently and uh it, it's gonna add one more dimension in that grid of uh uh features they they want to detect support or, or, or like do something special so yeah probably uh with like strong no uh it, w it will be hard uh to continue but i hope we will navigate this uh topic cool so do i hope and um yeah thank you very much Ilya, for being on the show I'm here with Ben Business, Business, Business from Mozilla. And um, yeah, he presented together with uh, DeepT from uh, Google a proposal called Memory Control, Controls, Control, Control. Um, and um, yeah, it's been a long day. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, we are yeah just out of the room. And um, there was a ton of discussion, actually. And um, to me, this proposal sounded relatively non-controversial. So I was surprised by the amount of discussion that it got. Um, so Ben, can you maybe just summarize what the proposal is, and then yeah, just how you read the room um, about people's opinion about it? So the memory control proposal is, in a lot of ways, just finally bringing forward for discussion a lot of features that have been discussed for advanced control of memory since the early days of WebAssembly. A lot of them you can actually find in the future features document in the WebAssembly design repo. The features that we were discussing were effectively bringing MMAP or MMAP-like features to WebAssembly. So talking about operations like a memory.map instruction, a memory.unmap, memory.protect, and some others that were discussed, such as memory.discard. And yeah, I mean, we expected that there would be some discussion because it's one of those proposals that on its face seems fairly simple. You know, in many cases, certainly in browsers, your WebAssembly application is running on a platform with virtual memory with an MMU in the CPU and a certainly native development for those same kinds of platforms expects this virtual memory model. Why not expose it to WebAssembly? And so in a lot of ways, the, the proposal is simply that. How can we expose those features to WebAssembly? But of course, WebAssembly today has a very different memory model where you don't have virtual memory. You have effectively a large buffer of bytes and can we reconcile these things? In a lot of ways, the discussion was about the ramifications of these new designs. And there, there certainly are some, some larger ramifications than there might appear to be at first glance. Does it interfere at all with uh, VASM GC, VASM garbage coll collection? No, it's almost completely orthogonal, if not completely orthogonal, to the WebAssembly GC proposal. Certainly as specified right now, what's currently in the overview and the designs that we've been discussing, they would have no interaction with WebAssembly GC at all. It is an extension of the linear memory model, which already really today has no interaction with the GC proposal. Uh, in fact, we heard from the Scala.js presentation that they weren't using linear memory at all. All of their usage of WebAssembly was using the GC proposal. Whether we add a mappable mode to linear memory or not, it's not going to affect them. Mm -hmm. So this is relatively early in its um, inception phase. So I think phase one right now. Um, were you hoping to get it to the next phase, phase two, or uh, were you just hoping to get some opinions from the room? If somehow by some miracle we achieved broad consensus on all of the open questions that we brought up maybe, but realistically what we were here to do today was to get community group feedback on a variety of questions. Our presentation was largely structured around open questions such as how we expose a mappable part of memory to WebAssembly modules and whether that lives in the JavaScript API or in the core spec, what types of operations we should have, whether we're comfortable trapping or not, if somehow there's a way to get most of what we want on top of the current memory model without the possibility of trapping. Lots of questions like that and we got some good feedback, some generally it was it was really good as one of the authors of the proposal to get the general vibe from the audience of how they were feeling about traps, how they were feeling about various MMAP operations. And I think overall, DeepD and I got what we were hoping for, which was just to sort of read the room, see where people are at, see how much people want it, see how much interest there is, and see what directions would be valuable for us to explore and prototype. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking of prototype, this would be my last question. Um, since this is co-championed by Mozilla and by uh, Google, is there some prototype uh, in either of the browsers already? Uh, a while ago, I believe that the V8 team prototyped a memory.shrink operation. 
we at Firefox prototyped the memory.discard operation, which at this point, based on the discussions we've been having, we actually don't expect to operate within a mappable region of memory, but could be a very useful utility for the typical linear memory on platforms that do have virtual memory support. So the proposal is likely to also include some virtual memory enabled features for the normal linear memory that give even traditional linear memory applications some extra control. But at the current moment, that's all that's been prototyped so far, just the memory freeing aspect of it. And I believe that the Chrome team is now going to start exploring an implementation of a memory.map operation that can take some specific kinds of JavaScript API resources and actually map them into the WebAssembly address space. And that's one of, as one of the key motivators of the proposal, we'll be very interested to see what kind of numbers they get out of that. All right, so looking forward to the next CG meeting where we hopefully will hear more about the future of the proposal. Thank you very much for being on the show, Ben. We're back, it's uh, day two of the event and actually it's day one of the community groups meeting. With me is Thomas Lively, the since uh, one month ago uh, newly appointed co-chair of the community, community group. And um, yeah, maybe we can just ask Thomas for his review of the morning. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I think it was a pretty good morning. Uh, we advanced some pretty important proposals to phase four, which means they're they're done. Uh, so that's super exciting. Any other list? Yes. So the, uh, what was it? The annotations proposal, custom annotations went to phase four. And that's just an improvement for the text format to allow it to represent uh, custom sections. And then building on top of that, the branch hinting proposal went to phase four which uh, allows for some optimization when you know that some code will never be run or almost never be run. Um, and then we just came off the heels of a interesting session on uh, FP16, so 16-bit floating point numbers uh, and, and the SIMD instructions that operate on them. And we had a pretty close vote to bring that to phase two, but it did not pass. We did not have consensus there. So there's more work to do. So can you tell us why this why this this is important? So we saw um, in Deepti's talk at Google I/O um, that she was uh, very excited about this. She was one of the persons who voted as strongly in favor. Um, but yeah, there was also some opposition um, from people from Apple, but also from Intel. Um, why do why do they not like this so much? What do you think? Yeah, so it's a it's a tricky tricky question. So why is it important? Well, uh, first of all, sixteen bit floating point numbers, of course, are only sixteen bits, whereas you know the floating point numbers we already support are thirty two or sixty four bits. So they're much smaller, and you can pack a lot more of them into the same amount of memory. So for things like on device AI, it's really really useful to be able to pack all of these numbers into a smaller amount of space. Uh, so that's that's why we want it. That's why it's useful. The problem is, uh, of course, WebAssembly is a virtual instruction set architecture, and at the end of the day, it has to lower to real instruction set architectures, and those support different operations. So the uh, a lot of the Intel instruction set architecture, a lot of Intel chips have support for some of the operations we need on 16-bit floating points, but not all of the operations. And so those missing operations would have to be emulated. Whereas a lot of ARM chips today already support all of those uh, those operations. So ideally, in WebAssembly, we want to provide access to the full capabilities of the hardware, maximize performance, but we also want portability, including portable performance. So whenever we get in a situation where one architecture would be able to execute WebAssembly much faster than another architecture, that's also kind of a place we don't want to be in. So what we're going to need to do is do more benchmarking, get more data, and get more consensus on what's the bar for including these new instructions. Uh, like, does it need to improve performance on the different architectures? Does it need to maximize performance on the different architectures? We just need to figure it out. Very exciting. Looking forward to seeing what's happening there. Um, another uh, two proposals I want to talk about quickly is branch hinting and compi compilation hints. Yeah. Um, they seem like connected somewhat. Um, could you just summarize about what are those about? Yeah, absolutely. So branch hinting in particular lets you annotate a branch, like an if-else, and say, 
this branch is very likely to be taken or unlikely to be taken. And that lets the engine figure out what code uh, is, is almost never going to be run. So if I almost never branch to a piece of code, the engine can take that code and put it far away, you know, keep it away from the hot code. And that means the hot code is all going to be closer together and faster to execute. So that's a nice uh, optimization. That's the only one included in that proposal, right? The branch hinting proposal is just that single annotation. Uh, and that just got to phase four, so it's finished. There's also this more general compilation hints proposal, which adds a whole bunch of new annotations for all kinds of different things like inlining and speculative inlining and just a whole bunch of different optimizations. That's a very early phase proposal. So we haven't even decided what all is going to go in it, right? It's still, you know, totally possible we'll add more or take things out. So we could have combined the proposals because they're so similar, but that would have held branch hinting back a lot. So it was a lot smarter to keep branch hinting separate, finish standardizing it, and then use the groundwork that's laid in the follow-on proposal, which will add a lot more stuff. I see. So um, if you have a branch in an if-else um, condition, and um, it's 50-50, obviously this doesn't make sense to annotate, well, because it's just like the same. But like, um, there was one question in the audience about um, the, the measurement um, since when this, this does make a noticeable um, impact. So can you tell us more about what this means? Like, uh, is it 60-40 or like what, what does your um, likelihood of a branch to be taken need to be in order for this to make sense? Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I think for this to make sense, especially the part where you take that cold code that's unlikely to run and put it far away, you only want to do that if you're pretty sure the code is not going to be run. Um, so I think something like a, a 90 or 95% chance uh, of the code not being run would be enough to, to put it in that section. But, you know, where the actual threshold is, where it makes a benefit, uh, you know, it's going to depend on the application, the tool chain. You'd have to benchmark it. So... I guess in, in JavaScript land, for example, um, the engine will just learn over time um, by looking at the code, what is um, like in a loop, for example, what is what is the likely branch? Um, I guess in VASM engine land, it's a little different, at least for some of the engines. Um, can you tell us more like what this means for um, different engines? If, if there's probably uh, potential for optimizing this more on some more predictive engines versus others. Yeah, absolutely. So. There's a wide variety of WebAssembly engines out there. Of course, in a web browser, they're really the same as the JavaScript engines, right? And, and, and they can share techniques. So in a web browser, you could do the exact same thing in WebAssembly and, and collect that information at runtime and make this decision yourself. The question is, do you want to? Because it you know, requires some complexity and some runtime performance just to collect that data in the first place. If the toolchain can provide the hints, then you can save that time at runtime and and, and not have to do that. So that's one thing. The other thing is there's plenty of WebAssembly engines that don't do any just-in-time compilation at all. So offline engines uh, like WasmTime will often just compile the entire module up front and then go run it, you know, potentially millions of times. And in that case, they can't collect any information at runtime. All they have to use is this information provided by the tool chains. So in that case, these hints are going to be very useful. All right. Thank you very much, Thomas.